Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. Thank you for the readers for volunteering. It's good to be with you in this online format. Um, part of the sadness associated with COVID is that we can't physically be around each other, create around each other, and that's something I think we genuinely like doing because I genuinely miss you all. So, um, yeah, we have 10 readers today. I'll kick things off with a little poem about Zoom meetings. It's called Mirror Games. I discovered my face without a self-esteem. When I was little, I studied this strange ambassador of me. My parents would catch me making faces into windows and mirrors and toasters and coffee tables, sunglasses, and they'd yell, stop playing mirror games. Dinners with Uncle Ralph and his family happened once a year. Dad and mom's careers were giving Uncle Ralph less and less to bully, but my weirdness gave him ample compensation. Now, I had fallen into a black hole of mirror games with a polished spoon, when my uncle ripped me out of reality and he said, what the hell is wrong with you, kid? Laughing enough for everybody. Now, as an adult, I took a class in a three-dimensional room with 12 three-dimensional people, and I could see all my me suit except for my face. Now, I class on a screen in the inverse, two-dimensional class with 12 two-dimensional people. And on this screen, I can only see my face. And I can't class when all I want to do is play mirror games. But, you know, I've never seen my face act in real time. It's my face right there, living in real time, mistaking in real time, hiding in real time. And the show must go on. And my face keeps acting, serving this idea behind it. All right, that's my spiel. We're going to hand it over to Karina Cohn next. Um, hi, um, so I'll be reading from a fiction story called Degrees of Retreat. Uh, you could find it in the Brooklyn Rail this month. Yay! So, um, okay, Degrees of Retreat. Every little thing in Rosa's house has energy, down to the dish towel. She never stands close to the microwave. All her pots are cast iron. Her clothes are cotton and her food organic. Every piece of furniture she and her husband bought has been replaced with its natural, unpolished wood equivalent. It has also been positioned in accordance with the electromagnetic field lines that Victor, the cancer expert, has mapped out on the back of Anna's science test. He maps a special kind of EMF, which he calls energy lines. Rosa can't see the lines, but Victor senses them through his palms. After an hour of walking in between bedroom appliances, last week they finished the kitchen. Victor takes out a pencil from his trousers and begins to sketch. This house is like a Manhattan grid. Is that bad? Rosa asks. Victor puts the sketch down and holds out his palms once more. He hovers by the bed. He double and triple checks and draws a line that crosses through the rectangle meant to represent the bed. We need to move it right now. When you lie down, there's an energy line running through your breasts, and you have been sleeping like this for, what, 10 years? Rosa nods. She has been so stupid. And what about Anna? She asks, peering over the map. We'll move hers next. They push Rosa's bed to the opposite side of the room. It is heavy, dead weight. A miniature statue of Ganesha falls off the nightstand in the disturbance. Victor moves the, elephant, the small elephant being to where he saw it before, on the pine shelf that is Rosa's shrine. Its familiars include an 8x10 of Blue Christ, 8x10 of Pharaoh Zoser, and a 4x6 of Sathya Sai Baba. There are also crystals, turquoise stones, rosary beads, and a tiny gold pyramid recommended by Victor himself for its ability to balance energy. Think of it like an air filter, he had told her, but for the spirit. He takes a seat in the middle of the repositioned bed, careful to avoid the lines. How is July, he says, next month too soon? No, let's book it. I'll see if Anna wants to come along. Great. Victor scratches at his short, wiry beard. This your pillow, the memory foam? Yes, AJ prefers the hotel marshmallow kind. You should see if you can change that. It's no good he sleeps like that. I tried already. He won't budge. Just switch it out. Victor takes Rose's memory foam pillow and plops it by the foot of the bed. 
This way from now on too. Rosa studies the bed and envisions nights of feet to head with AJ like raw yin yang shrimp. Tea break. They leave the room with the nightstands on the wrong end and the flat screen hanging oddly above the head of the bed, all to be dealt with. Rosa is out of lifestyle awareness and has been drinking traditional medicinals chamomile. She pours a cup for herself and Anna, one with a print of an aardvark and the other one of a dingo, and leaves an empty cup for Victor like an offering. He likes to drink from the pangolin. When he comes back three days later, they rotate Anna's bed 90 degrees to the left. Rosa changes the floral bedding to a baby blue winter themed identical set to her own. The material is cotton and good. Feng Shui is off, Anna says. There are health risks, Anna. Wanna look at the map? Rosa opens Anna's dresser drawers and begins to unravel its contents, t-shirts, undergarments, pajama shorts. You're going to need to make two piles. Victor knows which materials are bad for you. You can label the tags with a Sharpie. I'll be doing the same. Anna scratches at the tag on the back of her shirt. On it is a family of meerkats, lengthy, wide-eyed, and of course, nude. Her father bought it at a zoology conference. He is fond of odd animals. Victor stretches his palms to the shirt. That one is bad. Anna, take it off, Rosa says. What, now, Anna says. No, clearly after Victor leaves. Rosa pulls out three flabby $100 bills. The new ones, touched most recently by the print machine, were also no good. Victor pockets the cash and kisses Rosa on the cheek. Let's talk on the phone later this week, he says. Track any improvement. Thank you, that's it. Thank you, Karina. Um, next we have Rob Taylor. Hey guys, uh, this is an excerpt from a short story, which is part of a larger fiction project I'm working on. All right. Uh, things I want to tell little cousin, but will not. Sometimes I want to call and tell you that little black boys like us who rest their cheek on the back of their hand who run on their tiptoes and talk to themselves have superpowers. I want to tell you our eye contact would turn people to stone, that because we hang back, we can shape shift into anything we can imagine. That I know definitively it is impossible to read thoughts. I wish I could say that after a while, paralysis is not familiar, that pacing and wheezing get easier. I want to tell you, I wish we could have talked more before you left and believe it. Photos, one, two, three, four. I am between the hotel and spaces where others expect me to come back. I am standing in a closet-sized bathroom bored of inebriation. I look at the face staring back and in that state, do not like that I recognize it. Before I go ahead and shave it off, I take a picture with my phone as a reference for Francesca so she'll see how much of a mess I'll make. But when I look at the picture, I see shapes where my eyes and lips should be. I take another and another and another, each time rotating my head, trying to find familiarity. Instead, just more shapes, different shapes, shapes that were more refracted and less together with each snap. The only thing that looks familiar are the curves of a jawbone and spirals of an earlobe. I like the feeling of new. I want to tell you it's okay. You don't have to know what outside is like. I want to tell you that outside works just like the last time the family was all together, specifically when generations of uncles huddle by the TV and ask if we got any game. I wish I could say that question has an actual answer, that before they can ask, you will have something rehearsed. I want to tell you that rehearsing means knowing what to say, that after a while, our kind of quiet you'll grow out of. Your mom came from your room with a stack of crude drawings tucked under her arm like she was proud of them. She would tell the table that you reminded her of a little me, that you were basically me, captured in time when I needed to get out all my little characters. You were 17 with my 12-year-old escape plan. I wish I could say that you'll eventually find a meaning to all this. 
photos 25 and 26. I am tired of the camera on my phone. I'm tired of the simplicity. I pick up a new DSLR. There's something about the clicks and smoothness. I'm touched with every snap, slightly grazed by the glass and the flash of light that stalks it. I aim it at the chest, the snap, the shapes look like stained glass. I can feel the focus linger, tracing my collarbone to navel, strumming chest hairs along the way. Here, my neck looks unstable, like coiled tubing for cable wires. For the first time in a long time, I'm reminded that I have nipples and what that means, now appearing as Romulus shards. I can make out stripes Francesca left behind and stripes from before she met. They all feel seen, held for the first time. I want to tell you the world is open for boys like us to play. I want to tell you quick glances and glares will not stick on your skin, stick to your plan like everyone else has planned. I wish I could say you'll fall in love with snapping after pulling too far. I want to tell you depression does not have an element of vanity that we all don't have a version of. I wish I was less of this and more of that. Then again, I wish I could say explanations make things simple, that we have a choice of pain like sifting through shirt sizes. Sometimes I feel bad for forgetting to warn you that one day you'll run into people squinting at the sun and they'll call it magic hour. Their stare will become almonds and glass sheen like a lioness. Strong, beautiful people will burn saffron and ask whoever's listening, why can't I look like this all the time? Thank you. Thank you, Rob, it was beautiful. Um, next we have Shaughnessy Farrow. Hello, um, this is a story called Funeral. They liked to joke that when Julia got too drunk, her personality got taken over by her mean alter ego, cruel Julia, who they eventually came to call Cruelia. This was her and Tim's way of talking about the problem without actually talking about it. As long as it was a joke, it wasn't a fight. Finally, one night in February, she went to bed Cruelia and woke up Julia, who turned to Tim and announced, it's time to bury Cruelia. Really, Tim said, trying to sound neutral about the whole thing. He didn't like sharing a life and a bed part-time with Cruelia. Of course he didn't. But once Julia promised to banish her, it would, by definition, become a thing when she inevitably reemerged. Tr Tim dreaded the disappointment of being disappointed again. Yeah, Julia said. Mm -hmm. I had this dream where I murdered her. We got into a fight and I strangled her until she was dead. And once it was over, I just felt this big relief. So I guess my subconscious is saying, she's gone and she's not coming back. Hmm, maybe so, Tim said. But she deserves a funeral, Julia said with a broad smile. We need to say goodbye right. Of course we do, Tim agreed, trying to mimic her enthusiasm, at least outwardly. She's a member of the family, after all. If it wasn't a joke, it was a fight. They both knew that evoking Krulia's name was an excuse, but it usually came with an actual apology too, albeit one swaddled in a cozy layer of attempted irony, a performative dance they did as a couple. Tim sort of felt like killing Krulia this time was just a way for Julia to get away with never saying she was sorry for the latest of Krulia's misdeeds. No one wants to hear about your career anxiety anymore, she slurred at him the previous night as she, he told their friends about his current stall job search. Julia went to Princeton and had founded a meal startup kit, a meal kit startup with a friend whose dad was on Wikipedia's list of America's richest men and not at the bottom. She got interviewed by magazines about her success, had appeared on lists of impressive young people. Tim was a freelance writer who worked 50 hours a week in the offices of a magazine that would never officially hire him or offer him healthcare coverage. Krulia had refused to leave last night's party at 3.30 a.m. when Tim asked, though it was very clear that the host wanted very much for people to clear out. This was a habit. Krulia's violent disinterest in returning home at the end of a night out had really tanked Tim's Uber rating. I'm not gonna go home with you, she spat at him as he tried to steer her toward the car he had called. I don't need you. My life would be fine without you. We both know it wouldn't, he sighed back, though he knew that fighting with Krulia wasn't worth it. 
Half the time, Julia woke up apologizing for things she couldn't remember saying. He knew that she felt truly sorry, but it meant less when it came from a totally different person than the one who had hurt him. He knew Julia couldn't control herself. If she could, she wouldn't have done anything to be sorry for. They both knew there was only one way Julia could truly say goodbye to Krulia. She had to stop drinking. It was a solution they both knew she was not ready to consider. Tim hoped that if they just kept joking around it, she would come to it eventually. Still, Julia wanted to hold a funeral, so that's what they did. She closed the curtains and lit some incense and a candle that was designed to smell like freshly laundered towels. They took 10 minutes apart to come up with their eulogies for Krulia, which they read aloud to each other off ripped notebook paper. In place of a proper burial, as Julia still needed the corporal form she and Krulia shared, she lay down on the floor of their living room with her eyes closed and her arms crossed over her chest. Tim kneeled over her on creaky knees and said in Our Father, because that's the only prayer he remembered from Sunday school. He laid a single stubby yellow flower Julia had found outside their building on top of her hands, but it rolled off onto the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Shaughnessy. Next, we have uh, Dorothy Hahn. I'm reading an essay uh, that I posted to Medium this week called I Am Your Chink. Shopping these days while wearing a face mask, I brace for the instant my visible slanty eyes betray me as Chinese. Re reading the news about Asian Americans getting harassed by people blaming them for the coronavirus, I'm wary each time I leave my home in West Hampton, New York. So far, the burly contractors in Carhartt boots I pass in true value smile at me politely. Still, I can't help but be tense, waiting for some bigot to unleash a torrent of invective my way. I've heard slurs yelled at me before, like Ching Chong when I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, or go back to China when I traveled through Sydney, Australia. Still, the injustice of being targeted for prejudice didn't make me feel any less furious or sad. If a stranger were to confront me now and scream, you chink, and that the pandemic was my fault, how would I respond? In August 2019, on the first day of class, my introduction to creative writing students at Stony Brook University read aloud Marina Keegan's valedictory speech to her graduating class at Yale. Five days after the ceremony, Ms. Keegan died in a car accident. My student's first assignment was to write about legacy. What do you say to someone you might not see again? At our next session, the first reader began reciting his essay. Two paragraphs in, he uttered the N-word. Startled, I listened closely, trying to understand why my Black student called himself this to describe one of his two identities. The first was that of a young Black man uncomfortable deferring to white authority, namely that honky professor he had addressed the piece to who couldn't see past the color of his skin. The second was his alter ego, the painful slur demeaning to African-Americans, yet prolific in hip hop music and everyday language. Calling someone an N-word signifies that person deserves props or credibility. I realized my student called himself the N-word because he was proud to be black. Yet I was shell-shocked by the quiet detonation the word made, how saying two simple syllables could convey an entire history of oppression as well as self-respect. When Walter Mosley wrote an op-ed in the New York Times the next month, why I quit the writer's room, I seized the opportunity for a teachable moment and asked my class to read it out loud. Mr. Mosley was reprimanded by human resources at a network he worked for because he had used the N-word in conversation to explain a story about a cop he knew who stopped all niggers in patty neighborhoods and all patties in nigger neighborhoods because they were usually up to no good. Does anyone know what the term patty means? I asked. No one raised their hand. I explained to my uninformed students, since immigrants began arriving in America, many were called racist names. A patty is an Irishman, a wop, an Italian, a kike, a Jew. An N-word's a slur for blacks. A chink, I said, gesturing to myself, is someone Chinese. So class, who gets to use the N-word? Everyone pointed to my black student. Why? Because he's black, someone guessed. Because as Mr. Mosley says, I am the N-word. Mr. Mosley quit because he wasn't allowed to use the word to describe himself. To be black is to personify everything the word means, 
the history of slavery, of Jim Crow, of suppression. Turning to the Blacklord, I wrote in big bold letters a phrase from Mr. Mosley's piece, speak your truth. As students and writers, your goal is to use language to express yourself. Words inspire, words electrify, words can also hurt. I support each of you to speak your truth so long as you do so respectfully. I recalled this advice when I recently watched Ronnie Cheng do his stand-up routine, Asian Comedian Destroys America on Netflix. In it, he extols the badassery of black Americans owning their racial slur, the same way my black student dignified using the N-word to proclaim himself worthy. You never see Chinese people walking around saying, yo, where are my chinks at, my chinks, Mr. Cheng jokes. In these difficult times, I remind my fellow Asian Americans and less friendly neighbors, no matter what words are hurled at us, we chinks know we are worthy. If someone wants to call me a chink, I'd remind them, hey, we're all in this together. But if they ignore my appeal for community, I would disarm them using their own words of hate. Dubbing myself that weighted moniker, I declare my allegiance to the tribe of nearly 20% of the planet whose ancestors invented papermaking, gunpowder, the compass, and General So's chicken. I would yell back, yo, I am your chink, so you take care of yourself and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, next, we have Munwar Abbas. Hey, everyone, thank you. I'm gonna read some words I wrote, more specifically, lists. Uh, according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a list is a simple series of words or numerals. Now, list number one. Things people have said to me. You don't know how to love. How high are you? I wish you weren't so quiet. Can you grab that since you're so tall? Why are you so distant? Can I borrow a pencil? You won't be a good father. You look like that guy from that TV show. It's good that you know how to be alone. Didn't I see you running out of a liquor store? Why can't you just say what you mean? Sir, could you please speak louder? Things I wish I had said. I'm sorry. You, sir, are an idiot. Please don't leave. Believe me, we're acquaintances, not friends. You hurt me. Are you sure this is legal? Ask me more. You have to tell me if you're a cop. I'm sorry. You can't order your steak medium well, you dolt. Please leave. What, you didn't think I'd find out? No, 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 no. List number three. Things I've said to people. I'm pretty sure I have a heart. I don't know what you want. I'm a man. I mean, yes, I'm a man. Did I ask for your life story? Do you want water? You can't possibly hate me more than I hate myself. We're friends. Do you want water? I need it to stop, just for a bit. Como se dice, fuck no. I have nothing else to offer you. I wish I knew how to say what I mean. If I could be anything, I'd be a butterfly. Everyone talks about how Mary had a little lamb, but no one ever mentions a dead hooker in a basement. And last but certainly not least, I wish my life wasn't just a sum of things I've never said. And that is it. Thank you. Thanks, Manwar. Next we have Ariana. Hey. Hello, um, I'm Ariana McLean, and I'm going to read a poem, uh, a narrative poem that I wrote as part of Cornelius's class. Um, the assignment was to write a poem based on um, a Robert Frank uh, photograph from his series, The American. So this is the one that this poem is based on. So it's called um, Funeral in St. Helena, uh, South Carolina. Um, the photograph is called that. So here we go. Um, cars pile into the front yard of our grandparents' farmhouse. They'd been sharecroppers on this plot, always trying to earn enough, make enough, trying to win the unwinnable game, the American dream, but we're 
all playing and we all keep losing. The funeral went as well as a funeral could. How can you call a funeral good when the deceased is your baby brother? The one you were all supposed to protect, but instead we'd all move to the city, living our lives entitled to think that that was all that mattered. We bite our lips. Let the sharp pain distract us from the deeper guttural pain. He was a sweet soul. While his death may have been suspiciously reported an accident, his life actually was a beautiful accident. We were all probably accidents, but he more than us, as our mother already had three older boys, more than enough. But now we are three once more. We might have wished for this back when our parents brought home that small, strange bum bundle. He'd wake us up crying in the middle of the night. Was he hungry? Was he scared? Was he just a nuisance? He stole the attention we'd all always fought for. Being so close in age, we didn't know life without each other. And as the years went by, we forgot of life when it was just us three, the prime number, the sacred number, the trinity. But four was much better. Four was, is divisible by two. Four, um, you can make teams, you can make, um, you can play more games. Four makes a square. It's only when you slash a square in half that you make a triangle, a shape with three sides once again. We bite down on our lips, chew our fingernails, tap our legs as, as folks come by to wish us condolences. While we buried our father, it was different, painful, yes, but he'd lived a life, had a family. He was nearing the age to reap the benefits of the seeds he sowed, even if we weren't the best sons living in the city, wrapping ourselves in dapper dress, distracted by beautiful women and getting ahead, only coming home for the holidays. But baby brother had all but graduated high school. His smile beamed a reflection of our own as we watched him walk across that stage and get that coveted diploma. They thought he couldn't do it, but that boy was smart, whip smart if you asked grandma. The corners of our lips quiver, our hearts momentarily confused as we're engulfed in the memory of his sweet smile, his sharp sense of humor, his mind always questioning the world around him, testing our patience, challenging our hardened ways. And now he was challenging us once more, leaving us on this plane of existence to figure out the next steps alone. We bite down on our lips again. You'd think we'd be calloused by now, callous to the struggle, callous to pain, callous to death, but we all be dying and we all be living. We bite down harder on our lips, clench the jaw a little tighter. We don't say nothing. We don't make eye contact neither. We don't have to. Our hearts beat as one today, like most days, for as much as we mourn our brother, we know that it could have been us. It could have been me or me or me. We bite down on our lips, our inner cheek, let the gentle breeze and sun wrap us in a comfort we long for. We watch our mother wail in the back seat of a car, her mother's arms around her, mother and daughter rocking back and forth like the ebb and flow of the tides. We remember being held by our mother, but the memory is like a dream. You can't quite figure out if it was real or not. A misty, reoccurring memory, for little black boys cannot be little boys for much longer than a blink of an eye. And their mothers know it, they fear it. They know they cannot hide from it. We bite down on our lips, cross our hands, look up to the sky, asking gravity to swallow our tears. Tears will break us, tears, real tears, that would run down our face, will be the crack in the tightly wound effigies that we've made of ourselves. We don't let the tears melt away our armor because without that armor, our souls would harden like Medusa's lovers. So we don't let the tears destroy our, destroy our walls of protection. We let our hearts weep with each beat, flooding our veins with, fear of, uh, with tears of blood. And then the pause button is released. The movie keeps playing. It has always been playing and there and it was us who took the pause, stopping for no one, not even the dead. Life never goes as planned. Things happen, we react, continue to do so until the end. So we swallow hard, shake the hands of our old neighbors, our old friends from our old lives, when we used to live out here before the city consumed us. Like the crack of lightning, his death shook us awake. One more bite of the lip and we head inside the screen door, 
the comforting scent where savory meets sweet. Invite us to pile food onto a plate that we might only nibble at, but we know we have to eat something. Our stomachs growl, begging for something more. A bite of an apple, perhaps? Anything more than the bite of our lips. <laughs> that was great. Thank you, Ariana. Next, we have Christopher Barr. Hi there. Um, I'm just going to be reading the first few pages of um, a story that's still in work in progress, whatever. Uh, this is 1,500 miles on the Eisen. Okay. The cold coffins of, a, of our haulers could have had anything in them. We'd always thought of them as empty spaces more often than not. It kept our minds clear, and time there on the road and our time in general would become that much shorter that much more bearable. It wasn't that I didn't care, it was just the kind of people we were. No matter how far we'd gone, none of us could ever believe for a second that we were headed anywhere. I guess I'll start with the morning. Uh, gray, gray skies ground against the shifty kind of road haze we called pea soup. It was all drive-through country, dead town strangled by the Appalachians. The best way America knows how to kill, sunken Walmarts and McDonald's stuck on the edges of pine barrens, the wake followed by lines of moss cake trees, so I guess you could forgive us for getting lost in it all. Maybe it's un-American of me to complain so much. Yeah, you can say that I was, that I am bitter. Better to say I was, I am just tired. I nearly strained my neck to breaking when the biomon on my arm bolted me back from a drowsy half-sleep. I helped and slapped my arm and the neat little computer screen affixed to it, just like I'd been bitten by a fly. I had to keep myself from smashing the thing then and there, that cold metal that held affixed to my arm smooth enough that you could be fooled into thinking it belonged there. The screen flashed with red warnings. Warning, NREM sleep brain signals detected. Please follow road safety regulations. And with my one arm on the wheel, I swatted at the damn thing to stop the thing from vibrating the bones in the back of my hand. I had just make, made it onto the Eisens, that stretch, that stretch of tarmac, webs of interstates and back roads that winds through the Appalachians at about two o'clock in the morning. With all the tea, pea soup about, it was hard to get a good take on what, when I'd make it, but I got my first sense that I was finally on the Eisens when my cab began to lurch. My headlights cut my path through the dark in the soup, but I downshifted just to make sure there wasn't anything ahead that I would hit. I could feel every small gap in the road that sucked in my 18 wheels, one at a time. I'd driven the Eisens a thousand times before, so it wasn't new. This was once a glistening stretch of paradise road back before my time or my father's time, but now the entire thing was pockmarked like an acne-scarred face. No matter how many times you hear the politicians talking about this or that infrastructure bill, nothing ever gets done here. Hadn't for something like 20 years now. Christ, I was tired. My bosses, whoever the hell they were, I'd only heard their orders through the transceiver or read their signature on the pathetic pay stubs that showed up on my biomon from time to time. They had me set up on a sleep schedule that ran me through what the computer simulations would say was the optimal, most efficient work-to-sleep balance. It didn't matter how much we tell them, we knew better than they could when we were tired. We all knew that what they really wanted was to get from stuff from A to B as fast as inhumanely possible. You have to understand, by our nature, none of us was the greatest of social creatures. I had known some family teams that used to tackle the long haul, but they disappeared around that time. The industry started convulsing the new tech the non-diesels, the electrics, when they started rolling out the biomons and with the government making them mandatory to decrease the number of road fatalities, so they said. And, and none of that compared to what the self-drivers were going to do to us once the government got set with the regulations. I wasn't the most social type either, but loneliness eats away at your, your, your whatever it is inside, whether you like it or not. I had built up some impressive sturdy walls along the edges of my brain, my little solitary castle to keep me in and all the others out. But after three halls, back-to-back, 10-hour -back, sessions, followed by whatever little sleep they felt right to feed me, yeah, you guess I could say I was crumbling. And so that would be it. Great. Thanks, Christopher. Next, we have Meryl Branch McTiernan. 
Um, so this is uh, the beginning of something fictional inspired by a first sentence uh, provided by Matt Clam. <clears throat> there was a futon on the floor and a cat on my clothes. Where's your father? I asked the mangy calico who was staring at me while snuggling with my black dress. She didn't meow back. I looked around the room, trying to remember the name of the guy I had met at the third bar of the night. I couldn't remember the name of the bar or the guy, as it turns out. I thought it was something biblical, Noah or Jonah or Saul, probably not Saul. I told him I wasn't going to have sex with him. He said that was fine, that he was an excellent cuddler. And then he started fingering me in the cab. He offered me a drink when we got back to his place. For some reason, the only liquor he had was St. Germain. There was some story I couldn't recall. We mixed it with orange juice. It tasted kind of like drinking orange juice after br brushing your teeth. Then he made a big production out of showing me a clip from the movie Step Brothers because I told him that I put ketchup on everything, even steak. It took him forever to get it to project on his screen and I fell asleep in the middle of what must have been a 30 second clip, which seemed to piss him off, but not so much that he didn't want to have sex. So we did and I guess it was okay. We fell asleep on the futon and I woke up to see him getting out of bed. Where are you going, I asked. You're snoring, I can't sleep, he said. I should have just left then, but I didn't want to pay for a cab. You wouldn't believe how many times I've made pretty big decisions because I didn't want to pay for a cab. The door to his bedroom swung open and he entered the living room wearing only his royal blue boxer briefs, which had a small hole near the left side of his thigh. His body hair confused me. It clustered around the center of his chest, but not anywhere else, which offered the impression that he was a hairier guy than he actually was when he wore a button down, which he had the night before. I had mentioned this discrepancy to him and it made him self-conscious. So are you saying I don't have enough chestal hair for you? He inquired. No, it's the right amount, I assured him and ran my tongue down his chest to suck on his nipple, which was pink like a cherry blossom in bloom, though I opted not to tell him that. I always seemed to offend men when I was trying to compliment them. My ex-boyfriend Carlos had extremely soft arms and he never liked to hear about it. I knew that most would prefer to be called rough over being called smooth since they weren't cats, but that's not the texture that drew me in. My first love, Andrew, did have scaly arms and I restrained from mentioning it to him. Morning, he said, his voice a little hoarser than I remembered it. How do you take your coffee? I'm not picky, I replied. We have goat milk, oat milk, almond milk, and good old cow's milk if you're not super involved. The kind that comes from udders, por favor, I said. Sweetener? Only if you have that sugar that comes in the brown packets that's all crystal. I'll see what I can do, he said. You're old school. I like it. Yeah, do you have any cassettes I can play? He laughed and walked into the kitchen. Didn't you say you had to be somewhere, he, he asked. Fuck yeah, I have a baby shower on Long Island. Well, that's fucking horrible. Why don't you blow it off, he said. You obviously don't understand women. That's not what you said last night. Clearly, he was one of those guys who complimented himself on his own performance. At least I'd have a juicy story to tell at the baby shower to break up the monotony of all the breeder talk. I noticed a pile of mail sitting on the coffee table. I picked up a copy of Esquire. Jeremy, Jeremy Cravens. So it wasn't a biblical name, or was it? I had never finished reading the Bible, despite taking a class on the Old Testament in undergrad. Hey, was there a character named Jeremy in the Bible, I asked him. I don't know. It's not on my reading list, he said. You don't know where your name came from, I asked. I don't. Coffee's ready. Come pick your mug. I don't care. Just give me whatever, I said. You might not, but I do, he said. Is your mug collection some kind of Rorschach test? Maybe. I stood up, still naked, and walked to the cabinet. He had all kinds of crazy mugs with quippy sayings and pictures of animals. I picked up one with a pig sitting at a diner and ordering a BLT, hold the bacon. Do you not eat pork, he asked. I love pork. It's my favorite meat. I'll make you pork chops sometime. That would be nice, I said, although I meant in Chinese food and tacos, but I would take what I could get. I don't really have a kitchen. You're a strange bird, he said. Where did I find you? Good question. I can't remember. Were you that fucked up, he asked. We've been drinking margaritas since happy hour, so kind of but you were making so much sense going on about Hillary Clinton. I always talk about Hillary Clinton when I meet guys to disqualify the Bernie bros. I'm more of a yang banger, so we're both, we both like losers. I should probably get out of here and do my walk of shamelessness to Penn Station. Where are we, by the way, I asked. 7th Street and Avenue D, he said. Would you still go out with me if I lived above 14th Street? Depends how good the pork chops, chops are. Are you gonna get dressed? Thanks, Meryl. All right, to round out this reading, we have Grace Dilger. Hi, 
Hi, uh, grateful to be part of such talented company and thanks so much to Bobby for organizing. I'm gonna read three poems. The first is, soldiers with dogs are less likely to kill themselves. Brian shakes chocolate protein powder into a water bottle and does not kill himself. Brian washes his truck and does not kill himself. He hangs amaranthin ferns on whitewashed porch, watches his front door on an app on his phone, grills steak and asparagus, binges Gordon Ramsay, his cat on his shoulder and does not kill himself. Brian sprays beehives with raid, knocks a stick on his wood pile to clear out the snakes, strings lights on his back porch and does not kill himself. He squats, burpees, deadlifts, cleans his weapons on Wednesdays, frames photos without him of his family at weddings, does the shiplap all by himself, buys Christmas Febreze in bulk for all year round, tucks guest towels in his linen closet and does not kill himself. Brian mows his lawn, preps the week's meals in a knockoff Tupperware, looks too long at light bulbs in Lowe's, strokes the boxes of his favorites in the cereal aisle the way you'd place a stone on a grave. He checks his mailbox, checks his six, unravels the cord of the iron, presses his blues, humming so not to hear the helicopters, buries buddy after buddy after buddy, sniffs their wives' hair as they soak his lapel. For one moment, his contrite hug is the toned squeeze of their ghosts. He drinks all the coffee gone cold, swallows mac and cheese and ziti, deviled eggs, sweaty melon, figs, charcuterie till he can see that silver tray, listens to Kesha on the drive home, hears the barking before the car is even off. This is called birthday present. Why can't I remember any of them? My mother returning from Japan with little doors and stone monkeys, a millennial falcon blow up Godzilla, a butterfly brooch, Pokemon, Hello Kitty, test tubes, Fiji film. Why was it she always got us waterproof equipment? Why can't I remember one thing precious enough to live on a pillow, a quintessence of adolescent desire, something I wanted so badly I begged, a chinchilla, no dice. My gerbil, Leela, might have been a birthday girl. Now I smell their bedding like hoarder stink and think of my brother's hamster, which ate my Leela. I found her paw in the water bowl. Mom said they sometimes eat their babies because they smell like humans now. Leela wasn't Lemmy Wink's baby. She swivels, stress, stress can do it. Being pregnant, giving birth, having young, empties a stomach. And this last one's called Metamorphic. We loved our boys who bought us our favorite wine, black and milds. We loved our boys with droopy ear gauges and eyebrow barbells who electric taped our senior portraits to sun visors in their two-tone Jeeps. We loved our boys making out around Tack Lake, Turkish golds in ballast between their industrials and flat brims like Mont Blancs, who put Xanax on our tongues the way you turn off a light. We loved our boys sipping Arizona iced tea tall boys. They recycled as dip spit spittoons. We loved our boys hot boxing blunts down haunted roads, subwoofer blaring, one hand on the wheel, the other nudging our French braided heads towards the zippers on the brothers' old jeans who spiked the soda so we'd let them put it in our butts later. We sure loved our boys who peed in the beds we shared on nights it took us all to plop them down, whose chests recalled the rock cycle of sixth grade infamy. We loved our boys who snot sobbed between declarations of innocence, who came in our eyes and on our stomachs, who begged for nudes, one painted finger on our vulvas like a doorbell, whose mothers knew the color of our thongs by the way we said, how are you? We loved our boys who wantingly clutched all our jiggling, jegging waterbeds. Our boys shared so nicely. We loved our boys who knelt in the street for flip phone photos, who snapped our breasts when we'd fall asleep because sometimes we had to go home. We loved our boys, their blunt snouts and slender bodies, the salamanders of our sheets. We loved our boys who followed us to the outhouse, pushed us up against the tree. We loved our boys who never meant to hurt us, whose whole world were us, who would blame us in their notes if we ever. Listen, we loved our boys and our boys loved us. Thank you.
That was great, Chris. Thank you. Everybody, that's what we have today. I want to thank Frank Imperiali, who made this idea a technology for everyone to participate in. Thank you for the readers. It was really good. It's great to see you all and hear your work. Thank you to everybody who tuned in. And that's a wrap for today. Great. Come check us out on uh, Monday. We'll have uh, 10 new people. Take care. Mm -hmm.